Good morning, everyone. My name is Tashayar Jafari, and I graduated from Penn State University. My PhD advisor is Professor Farshad Rajabipur. The title of my presentation is Pozolanic Reactivity and Performance of Calcine Byproduct Clays of Various Colonite Contents in Concrete Mixtures. This work was funded by FHWA, York Building Product Company, and Siamtis. So supplementary cementitious materials have been used in concrete to improve the durability, sustainability, long-term strengths, and reduce the overall cost of the application. As you can see in the figure, since, since 2008, the production of coal fly ash in the United States has declined by more than 60% due to coal power plant closures and conversion to natural gas fuels. In addition, the majority of high quality fly ash has been used in concrete. As such, there is a significant and urgent need to identify and evaluate reliable sources and calcine clays have shown to be promising. So calcine clay is impure colonite clay that heat treated at a temperature between 650 degrees C to 850 degrees C. The majority of colonite deposits in the world are mixed clays and contain other minerals such as quartz and hematite. Colonite is a common mineral in soil and is abundant in more weathered soils such as UT soil. In this presentation, we look at two clay sources that are byproducts of aggregate processing. The aggregate producer needs to wash the aggregates after crushing them to reduce the fine particles, and this practice results in waste slurry. So two low purity clay samples were obtained from a sand and gravel pit in Maryland, and primarily we believe that this waste slurry include clay minerals. Clay number one was directly sent from washout line versus the other clay, which is clay number two, was excavated from storage ponds that has been kept for a few years. The two clay samples were dried and crushed to fine particles and then calcine. The resulting calcine clay were milled in a ceramic bowl mill to obtain materials with hypozolanic reactivity. The QXRD diffraction pattern for clay number one showed the high amount of quartz fraction in the clay, which also stays after calcination and acts as an inert filler. So separation of quartz is of prime importance to improve the reactivity of calcine clay. As can be seen, the SEM image of clay, the quartz intimately intermixed with clay, so simple density separation techniques would not be able to separate quartz from clay. As a result, surfactant-assisted sedimentation was used. In this technique, clay agglomerates are dispersed in water by use of a surfactant. This practice results in an ion exchange on the surface of a clay, giving the clay a net positive surface charge result in electrostatic repulsion. As such, the quartz particles are free of charge and can easily settle at the bottom of the cylinders. A number of surfactants were tested and it was found that sodium hexamethylphosphate was the most effective one. As can be seen in the left figure, a quartz sediment layer formed at the bottom of the cylinder. Although sodium hexamethylphosphate showed the promising performance, minimizing its dosage is favorable to reduce the cost. To determine the optimum concentration of the sodium hexamethylphosphate, the sedimentation experiment was repeated at different dosages from 0.5% down to 0.006%. The loss on ignition or LOI of the suspension and the sediment layer was measured to evaluate the clay content of each fraction. In addition, the colonite content of the suspension was calculated using a simple oven and balance method. In this method, a mass change of suspension due to heating from 400 degrees C to 600 degrees C, which is the lower and upper dehydroxylation temperature of colonite was measured. It's observed that the, the LOI of the suspension, which is the blue curve, increased initially with increasing the sodium hexamethylphosphate dosage, but remains constant after that. Similarly, the colonite content of suspension, which is the gray curve, plateau after a point. As such, 0.06% sodium hexamethylphosphate was chosen for purification. Also, visual observation can confirm these results. And as it's clear, the sedimentation layer in the first two cylinders from the right are a mixture of clay and quartz. And the height of the quartz fraction in the third cylinder is lower compared to the rest. So the fourth cylinder from the right was chosen for purification, with the which the concentration of the sodium hexamethylphosphate in that cylinder is 0.006%. In addition, I would like to add that because the clay came in a slurry form, this wet sedimentation technique makes sense. And we didn't have to wet the clay and dry it again. 
The QXRD showed that the CC1 contains the, high, the highest quartz content, which is around 60%, while CC2 has only 35% quartz. The amorphous content in CC1 is around 28%, and in the amorphous content in CC2 is 49%. And as, it, as it's clear, the amorphous content of CC1 is very low. As can be seen, the purification technique can reduce the quartz content from almost 60% down to 2.2%. And as such, the amorphous content significantly increased to 64.4%, which is advantageous. Here is the physical and chemical properties of three calcine clays. It can be seen that all three could meet the ASTM limit, except a slightly higher water requirement for CC2 and PCC and a slightly lower strength activity index at seven day for CC1. Also the alumina content, which is a good indication of clay content and the strength activity index are higher in PCC compared to other calcine clays, which shows the highest reactivity in PCC. In addition, the pozzolanic reactivity was measured using R3 test. You can see the mixed design of the paste in the table. After mixing, this, this paste samples were cast in a sealed container and cured at 40 degrees C until the test day. At the test day, the sample were demolded, dried, and milled to measure the chemically bound water and percent unreacted pozzolan used acid dissolution at various ages. In bound water tests, the powders were placed in a kiln to measure the mass change due to heating up to 350 degrees C. Also, the percent unreacted pozzolan were measured using acid dissolution test. In this test, the powder was added to one molar hydrochloric acid mixed for 20 minutes and then vacuum filtered. In this method, all the hardened phases dissolved in the acid while the unreacted pozzolans remained intact. So the bound water results at seven day for all three calcine clays are shown in the left figure. It confirms that PCC is the most reactive pozzolan followed by CC2 and CC1. Also, we can see that the reactivity of CC1 increased significantly after purification. In addition, the bound water at different ages were tested on only clay number two. It's, ob it's obvious that by increasing the curing time, the chemically bound water increased while the majority of the reaction occurred in the first few days of dehydration. The acid dissolution was performed on CC2, which is shown in the right figure. In Y axis, we have the percent unreacted pozzolan and in the X axis, we have the testing age. It shows that the reactivity of CC2 increased with time. However, the majority of the reaction occurred at the first few days, which means that after one day, the reactivity of CC2 is 27%. However, this value after 28 days is 40%. In addition, the effect of replacing 20% of cement with calcine clays on properties of concretes are reported in the table. As can be seen, calcine clay mixtures required significantly higher superplasticizer dosage compared to the control to achieve this slump. Also, as we go to clays that have higher colonite content, the superplasticizer demand tends to increase. Air content in fresh and hardened state concrete were almost similar among all mixtures and were achieved using almost the same air in trainer at mixture dosages. In addition, the air void spacing factor was below the limit of 0.200 millimeter in indicating adequate free stud reality for all mixtures. This figure shows the compressive strength results. All three test mixtures showed lower strengths at seven day compared to the control while at Later ages, the one with the highest amount of amorphous content showed almost comparable strengths to the control, while other two mixtures containing CC1 and CC2 having 10 to 15% lower strengths. Also, the ability of calcine clays to mitigate alkali silica reaction or ASR is shown in the right figure. In this study, two types of aggregates were used. The first one is moderately reactive aggregate or R1, and the, the second aggregate is highly reactive aggregate or R2 aggregate. In the figure, we can see the final expansion versus calcine clay dosage, and it's observed that the replacing cement with calcine clays reduced the ASR expansion. For highly reactive aggregate, 20% PCC, 25% CC2, and 30% CC1 was required to reduce the ASR expansion below the failure limit. While for moderately reactive aggregate, lower percentage can do the job and we can see that 10% PCC or 
15% CC1 or 15% CC2 was sufficient to mitigate ASR. The main idea in ASR mitigation is that lower replacement level are required when using calcine clay with higher amorphous content. So the rapid chloride parameter results are shown in the figure in which in y, in y axis we have the charge pass and in the x axis is the amorphous content of calcine clays. We can see that the chloride ion penetrability of all mixtures, including control mixture, are in the moderate range according to ASTM standard. However, using CC1 can slightly reduce the charge pass, while CC2 and PCC can significantly reduce this value compared to control mixture. The icing salt used for ice and snow melt on concrete causes physical damage on the surface of concrete during freeze thaw cycles. Left figure showed the cumulative scaling loss versus cycles, and we, we see that this method was performed on control and CC2 mixture, and also we do the same test on 50% slag mixtures for comparison. As it's clear, both control mixture and CC2 mixture performed similar to each other, while the slag mixture has a significant scaling problems. Also, the surface of concrete slabs after exposing to 50 cycles of freestyle shown that both control mixture and CC2 mixture are considered as a slight to moderate scale. In summary, this slide showed that calcine clays or clays from the same source, as we increase the amorphous content, the performance increase. As an example, the 28-day strength activity index, 28-day compressive strength, and seven-day bound water increased, and the required dosage to mitigate ASR decreased by increasing the amorphous content of calcine clays. This can be used to determine whether a certain amorphous content of calcine clays is acceptable performance-wise or not. And here is the conclusion. Purification can enhance the calcite content of clay, which can significantly improve the performance of calcine clays. Impure calcine clay and purified calcine clay meet all ASTM requirements for class M basalon. They could produce high quality concrete with target, with achieve target slump and air content, mitigate ASR, reduce chloride permeability, similar slightly lower strengths versus control and similar scaling resistance versus control. With that, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Kashayar. There's a, a, a comment in the um, Q&A that I'd like to read out loud because I think it's a, an important one. Um, it says, thanks for the results of the freeze thaw scaling as we have not done any work in this and people always ask. And so this is a very good contribution to the field. It's recognizing the uh, importance of your work. So that's fantastic.